Thank you very much, and it's my pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to be talking to you about my work. Now, it's estimated that about half of the world's population speaks more than one language, effortlessly, fluently, and regularly. Does this experience have any effect on these individuals, their language abilities, their cognitive abilities? Everything about our experience we now know profoundly affects our minds and brains. There's research showing taxi drivers in London who have to learn all the streets and alleys of London have an enlarged part of the spatial navigation part of their brain. Musicians have rewiring and reorganization of their brains and cognitive abilities from the experience of playing music jugglers, video game players, every intense activity that we engage in leaves its mark on our minds and brains. What about language? Of all human activities, there can't be anything that's more intense and more consistent and engages more of the brain than language does. So are there consequences? Well, obviously, there are consequences for language. Bilingual people speak more than one language. They can travel. They can order better food in restaurants. They can see the other side of arguments if they're in another language. Those are obvious differences. But what I want to talk about is the possibility that just knowing two languages or jamming two languages into the same mind-brain structure somehow changes the mind and brain. With aging, cognitive facilities, resources, and skills naturally decline. Cognitive reserve is the idea that engagement and stimulating activities maintains those functions. This is what you hear all the time. Do crossword puzzles, join a group, read books, do aerobic exercise. All of those activities are known to feed into cognitive reserve and maintain general cognitive levels. The, the feature of all those activities is that they are difficult and stimulating. So to put it as a simple piece of advice, difficult stimulating activities are good for your brain. Now, what is more difficult and stimulating than learning a foreign language? It's a wonderful idea. It's been done. <laughs> so I'll tell you a couple of examples. We've done it with children. <clears throat> we have run two studies where we take five-year-old children and then give them a summer camp experience where they have intense exposure to either music classes or art classes or French classes. They're all monolingual at the start. None of them knows anything about music. And then we test them before and after these experiences to see what changes. And we can track the changes. We've done it with college students where we test them before they start a first year Spanish class. These are monolinguals, they have no foreign language experience, and we give them a battery of our tests and then send them off to do uh, Spanish 101. And we come back at the end of the year and test them again, and we compare them to a group of their peers who didn't take Spanish in the first year, they took introductory psychology. So again, when we compare them at the end of the year, we can see what's different and we get all the right effects. And finally, a recent study out of Edinburgh did the same thing with the group of retired seniors in the outer islands of Scotland whereas a kind of a senior activity, they engaged in either, oh, I don't know, various kinds of history classes or literature classes or language classes. They learned Welsh. 
and again, they got exactly the same results. So you're right, because the majority of the research suffers from this basic correlational design. But there are studies that are able to extract that exact pattern using training. This is really important. So first, before I answer the question, because it deserves an answer, I have to say that my guess is, my guess is going to be, because we have some data, it's not how proficient you are, it isn't even how much you switch between languages, it's simply a quantitative assessment of how much you use both languages. So that's where I think it's going. Now, from a more empirical point of view, we are currently developing, we're about to hopefully publish, an instrument that's very detailed and has component scores that we extracted through a factor analysis from this long instrument, where we can look at the role of switching, the role of proficiency, and so on, to try to figure out exactly what you're asking, which of these aspects of the complexity of bilingual experience is most important. So we don't have the final empirical answer, but from what I've seen, my guess is it's quantity of use for two languages. When I'm talking about usage, I mean um, usage towards some balanced ideal. So the more you're using both languages, so what I'm saying I don't think is going to matter ultimately is let's say you have kind of 50-50. I don't think it's going to matter quite as much about your patterns of mixing and switching. I think what's going to matter is that you're using both languages 50-50. I think it's that idea of balance. I think there's also an important point here that you're not raising but I think follows from your question. And there are large demographic differences in bilingualism. The research I do is conducted in Canada, where the demographics of bilingualism is completely different from the demographics of bilingualism in the US. And it's different in important ways. And I'll just say that because of the climate, the demographic climate and attitudes in Canada, it's much easier for an individual to achieve that kind of 50-50 real bilingual usage because languages are more supported, they're more tolerated, and they're more valued in Canada than they are in the US, which is a more homogeneous, predominantly English society. This is an interesting question because there, there are some people who claim they have an answer to it. My strong feeling is that we can't really know. Here's one reason we can't really know. And, and there are people who publish data saying more is better. But here's a problem. When we're researching bilingualism, especially the kind of heritage language bilingualism that I study here, where we just have families who have maintained their heritage language over a couple of generations. So the children and grandchildren know that language. Nobody in those communities made a choice to become bilingual. So they didn't learn you know, Farsi or Portuguese or Somali or Swahili or Urdu, whatever the language is. And there are 140 languages in our community that are used in homes. Children didn't make a decision to learn them. Parents didn't say, well, you know, my child is really smart. I think I'm going to expose him to the language. There's no pre-selection. Um, and that makes it a powerful test. And that's why we find these bilingual monolingual differences at all socioeconomic levels and all kinds of language group levels, because it has nothing to do with pre-selection. However, when you get to multilingualism, I think it becomes more complicated. I think here we may indeed have pre-selection. 
And people who go on to master multiple languages and keep multiple languages active in their repertoire may indeed have other confounding factors. They may be smarter, they may be more motivated, they may be more talented, they may have better language learning skills that relate to these attentional functions that I've been talking about. So it becomes less clear that differences between multilinguals and bilinguals and monolinguals are purely because of the number of languages they speak. I'm not saying they are or they aren't, I'm saying it's just harder to know. We've actually looked at that and we found that the kinds, music is <coughs> the best example because it's the most similar. And what we found is that the effects of musical training are similar but not identical to the effects of bilingualism. Um, and that individuals with both, we have not seen any additive benefit. We have not found it. Perhaps it exists. Perhaps we haven't used the right kinds of measures to find it. Um, but what we find instead is that there's slightly different outcomes for each, and so each experience serves up its own kind of, uh, of effect. Um, the additive part of it, we haven't found. In fact, we rarely find additive effects. Um, I can give you another example. We know that low SES is associated with poor attention, poor performance on all of these executive function tasks than um, higher SES. So in our studies where we've compared middle class children and what we call working class children because they weren't really in poverty, uh, basically they had parents with lower education, so they lived in less stimulating environments. So we compared them, and in each group we had monolinguals and bilinguals. Again, we just found two main effects, no additive effects. So lower SES was associated with poor performance, and monolingualism was associated with poor performance, but they, didn't, they weren't additive. So monolingual low SES kids weren't doubly disadvantaged. So we recently published a study on exactly that question, which we irreverently called the lapsed bilingual effect. So here's what the study was. We took again our sort of 20 year old young adults, our university students, and we had three groups. One is just monolinguals, so we know who they are. Now the bilingual group this time were kids who had become bilingual primarily because they attended these very popular programs in Canada, French immersion programs. So in these programs, when you enter kindergarten at five years old, from that point on, everything that happens in school is in French, everything. So these kids learn a lot of French. They don't all become bilingual, but we selected those kids who stayed in this program through the end of high school and continued to use French up to the present. So they were taking university courses in French and so on. So they really were French English bilinguals who had become bilingual through these programs. So those are our monolinguals and bilinguals. Our last group is this funny kind of thing because French immersion programs are super popular. There's waiting lists to get in, there's lotteries to get in, people buy expensive houses to be in a neighborhood where the school offers these programs. These are really popular. But after uh, sixth grade, just before the transition to middle school, a huge number, huge number, maybe the majority, I would say, of kids move back into mainstreaming, mainstream English and a huge number of them never speak another word of French. 
So here we have your situation. They used to be bilingual and now they're monolingual. And the transition happened about halfway through their lives when they were 10, 11 years old, right? So we found all of these lapsed bilinguals, kids who had been in French uh, immersion in elementary school and not used French since. All three groups get the same battery of attention and executive function tests, okay? So here's the results. The bilinguals do better than the monolinguals, just like we always get. What do you think happens to the lapsed bilinguals? You tell me. I actually have no idea. <laughs> it's incredibly logical. The results are exactly halfway between the other two groups and not significantly different from either. So they're right in the middle. Now, it would be, that's only 10 years after they stopped using French. I think it would be interesting to find these people in another 10 years and see if they're still halfway or if they keep kind of monolingualifying uh, as time goes on. But for this period of 10 years at least, there's residual effect. So I would assume that if they then resumed using another language, they would get back their bilingual brain. So as an older adult engaging in the activity of learning a foreign language, you're exercising your brain. You may never become bilingual. You may never get those kinds of changes in the way your attentional system is allocated, but you're keeping your brain active. And that's an important thing to do. At the same time, there's a study I mentioned earlier in which the retired people in the outer islands of Scotland, after this um, intense foreign language learning experience, were indeed starting to show some of the actual bilingual effects, but obviously to a lesser degree than you'd see in lifelong bilinguals. So it's always a good idea. And anyway, you also get to learn another language. And people lose sight of that. That's a good thing. It isn't like taking medicine that's good for you. It's taking something fantastic that gives you, you know, all sorts of advantages besides the, the clinical ones. 